This is The Speaking Show. I'm David Newman, and you're tuned in to the number one podcast for speakers, consultants, and experts who want to speak more profitably. My next guest, of course, there was no previous guest because we have one guest per episode, but my next guest is the awesome and amazing Vivica Von Rosen. How are you, my friend? I am excellent. I'm so glad to be here again. It's been a long time. We got to catch up on- We got to catch up. Everything. everything. <laughs> Things Still have around. changed since you did the first book. Yes. Crazy town. Crazy town <laughs> in here. So your expertise is LinkedIn. Yeah, Give personally. Give a quick sketch of kind of how that evolved, how LinkedIn became your thing, how yeah. you gravitated towards becoming a master of that particular platform. <laughs> right. So two companies ago, I had a day job and I wasn't very good at it. But one element of the day job was connecting, you know, business owners, small businesses with networking and marketing ideas. So during a networking event that I had created for our, our membership, I brought this person in to talk about Web 2.0, which tells you how long ago it was. Because the idea that the concept that the internet was interactive was like a new thing. This is way before social media as we know it today. So anyway, at the end of her presentation, she mentioned this thing called LinkedIn. And I'm like, wow, 7 million members. Like that's a whole bunch of people. And I have a virtual aspect to my company. So wow, this is awesome. And so, you know, again, shows you how long ago, like I think they just topped 655 million people. And this is before Facebook with its 2 billion members. But you know, back in 2000, I think it was six, these were big numbers back then. And so anyway, I learned everything I could about LinkedIn. Long story, really condensed because we don't have three hours. I got picked up by an international association that had me start teaching their membership about LinkedIn. And then fast forward a little bit, Wiley reached out to me to write a book for them. And fast forward a little bit, Mike Stelzner, social media examiner, invited me to come speak at his conference, Social Media Marketing World. So I've been at everyone since day one. And then all the other stuff that comes along with positioning yourself as a thought leader and an expert. And oh, I got the Twitter handle at LinkedIn expert and the YouTube handle and the Instagram handle and the LinkedIn handle. And so that helps with Google being the LinkedIn expert. And then two and a half years ago, um, it got together with my now partners in Vangresso and created this new company, which was really great because I was at the point, I think you and I were talking then, not that we ever stopped, but I mean, it's like, I'm not talking to David anymore. But I was I just like- that a lot. Well, welcome to my personal life. Yeah, right. <laughs> and I was just kind of like, oh my God, I'm so sick of LinkedIn. And I was really, I was thinking, am I going to move into like life coaching, executive development? Like, what am I going to do that's not LinkedIn? And so I got together with my now founders of Vangresso, co-founders of Vangresso, Mario Martinez, Kurt Shaver, Bernie Borges, and there were a couple more people, but they've, you know, squeezed themselves out. Is Kurt Shaver still tall? He is still very tall. He has not shrunk in size. He has a brother who's one of our directors who is equally tall and blonde and Nordic looking. <laughs> Just checking. So, yeah, we have our two dark haired members, our two Nordic members. I mean, you know, we try to, we have men, we have women, we're, we're all about inclusivity. Yeah, so we got together, we formed Vengresso, and it's just been a wild and exciting ride. And I think what's most exciting for me is it's a different audience for me. There's mind share. Like I really, I was speaking at a conference last week and I was just like, you know, I thought I knew everything. I thought I was like, you know, the schism when it came to LinkedIn and that no one could teach me anything. And of course, the second you think you know everything about your topic of expertise, you can just start going down the drain. So having this mind share with such awesome, awesome people just opened up my world again. So new audience, new areas of expertise, new content, like so really exciting to be in that position right now. That's me in a nutshell. You in a nutshell. That's like two nutshells. That's like a whole Even nut. in a couple nutshells. You put the two half nutshells together, you get the whole nut right there. Yeah, there we go. I'm Solid nothing if not a nut. nut. <laughs> exactly. Well, let's start by debunking this yes. massively misunderstood concept of social selling. Yeah. Because people think, oh, I know. LinkedIn is the social selling platform let me just connect with a whole bunch of people and start pitching them stuff. And that's uh, what they must mean by social selling. 
So give us a little bit of a history and background because you were in on this from ground floor, totally yeah. square one. What was social selling back in the bad old days or the good old days? How has it evolved yeah. to a much more sophisticated relationship building platform? And then what do people need to know about it today? Yeah. So, and it's interesting. It, hey, at least people think that LinkedIn might be a good selling platform because I mean, most of my education, the first probably six years that I was teaching and training on LinkedIn, it was like, no, it's not just for <laughs> recruiters. It's not just where you put your resume. In fact, that's one of the things we say is you're, you want your LinkedIn profile to be a resource, not a resume. Because you're not, I mean, you might be selling yourself in that you're selling your expertise in an area, but yeah, you're not looking for a job. And I think one mistake that people make, especially when it comes to social selling, is thinking, you know... Well, it's, I'm on LinkedIn already. I uploaded my resume in 2007. I'm on LinkedIn already. And then they watch some video from some idiot out there saying, you know, connect to as many people as possible and then start, you know, private message them all as soon as you connect them and, and automatically add them to your email list and then, you know, sell them stuff. And so there's so many areas that are wrong with that scenario and there's so many reasons it fails. And, you know, for folks who sell the done for you product, first of all, it goes against LinkedIn's end user agreement. Secondly, they don't care if your account eventually gets restricted. It's nothing on them. And a lot of these people are using automation tools in order to connect with as many people as possible and shove that sales message down their throat. And like any spam, it must work to some level because people keep paying for it and people keep offering it as a service, which drives me insane. And I think that's what people think social selling is. You get on LinkedIn, you connect with a bunch of people and you try to push your stuff because that's how these done for you companies are selling it. And it's maddening because again, it doesn't hurt them other than they might lose their $2,000 a month client. It hurts you because LinkedIn goes, yeah, no, sorry, you've been too much spam out there and you no longer have an account with us. And that's an incredible detriment. So to back up a little bit, to me, social selling is, it has many components. First of all, you have to create a strong brand that's aligned with how you serve people. So not so much aligned with what you do and the features of your product or service, but how do you help people? How do you serve people? You know, whether it is you run a nonprofit and you help to create an opportunity for donors to align with cause marketing, or whether you teach social selling and help more sales professionals have more conversations with more qualified leads, or whether you teach influencers to stand out online by having a strong brand, or whether you help people to become influencers and therefore position themselves as trusted advisors. Like we don't know the companies, one of those is ours. We don't know the companies that are aligned with those value props, but that's the first shift that needs to happen is people need to position their LinkedIn profile as a resource. They need to build a strong brand on there. They need to look like themselves. My favorite's going to a conference and meeting someone that you've you know been communicating with on LinkedIn and you're like, but he has hair and you don't or whatever, you know, like the 15 year old photo, the 15 year old photo and really, and then it's a resume, right? I'm a quota crushing sales guy. I hadn't been president's club for 14 years. I don't want to work with the quota crushing sales guy who's been in president's club for 14 years because he's going to be selling me. I want to work with someone who can help me in whatever area or arena I need. So that's number one of social selling is having that strong and aligned brand that's focused on your buyer and their needs. The second is providing them with, and I think this is where the, the social part comes in, providing them with information in all aspects of the buyer's journey from awareness to consideration to purchase to advocacy providing them with, and actually I think there's a couple more in there, but providing them with the information, your buyers with the information they need when they need it in several different forms. And that information, by the way, shouldn't always be my products, my services. And then number three is 
listening in on conversations on LinkedIn so you can actually follow your prospects on LinkedIn, see if they're engaging. Sales Navigator is very useful for that. See if they're engaging and kind of like you would in real life, right? If you've ever walked into a big event, a networking event, a trade show, you don't hopefully run up to someone with your business card in your hand. You kind of slide up to a conversation, listen in on the conversation, insert yourself when it makes sense and then take it to the next level. And you should be using LinkedIn and social selling that way, listening to conversations, starting to slide in where it's relevant. And then, and only then, do you earn the right to invite someone to connect. And by that point, they already know who you are. You might not have earned their trust yet, but at least they know who you are. Hopefully they even like you a little bit. And that gives you a much more solid foundation for earning their trust. And then eventually, yes, moving into the sales conversation whether you're a salesperson or a consultant or a job seeker or whatever, it's still basically that process. And I think where most people get it wrong is A, they don't have a brand. B, they move into connecting long before they've earned the right to do that. They move into connecting? Yeah. So they invite someone to connect before they've earned the right to do so. So, right. And so this is the big switch. Let's talk about this because I've never heard this before. It's like, wait a second. Can I just connect to anybody, tap them on the shoulder, says, hey, buddy, I'd like to connect with you. If you have some rational reason, some, you know, presumably relevant reason to connect, but you're saying, no, 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 you got to earn the right to connect with them before you ask to connect with them. What does that look like? Yeah. And in some cases, you know, there is no other way. So you invite them to connect or you send them an email. But so our whole process, and that's really what differentiates us from most of the other social selling and LinkedIn training companies out there is that differentiation that we try and get you to engage with your audience before inviting them to connect. For the reason I just said, in real life, you wouldn't be shoving, you know, your business card in people's faces before you've at least tried to have a conversation with them. And so the easiest way to do that by far is the referral. And so when you go to LinkedIn, whether you're using free LinkedIn or sales navigator, you can see who you have in common. And so one of our two, we call it our two-step strategy, TM, but uh, (laughs) not TMI, but TM. So, you know, the first step is asking more than one person for the introduction and then saying, hey, but don't send it yet. Just let me know if you're willing to introduce me to John Smith. And then, you know, when two or three out of the five or six people say, yes, I'm willing to introduce you to John Smith, then you go, okay, great. David Newman is for sure the person I know best. And just looking at that person's profile, probably the person that John Smith knows best. So I would tell my other two people, oh, thanks so much. You know, I really appreciate it. Someone else reached out. And so, you know, let me put a pin in that favor for the future. And hey, is there anyone I can introduce you to? And then I go, to you, David, and say, hey, you know, um, thank you so much for being willing to introduce me to John Smith. You know, if you don't mind, you know, I'll write out the introduction for you or I'll give you some bullet points. And would you please just CC me when you introduce me? That way I know if you actually did bother introducing me to John Smith or not. And we're not using, well, LinkedIn pulled their introduction tool from free LinkedIn, but we're not using necessarily LinkedIn to do that, although you can. It's easier, I think. And then you can CC on the message, you can CC on a private email, but basically I'm asking someone who we have in common to introduce me. I'm confirming that they're the best fit to introduce me and I'm giving them the languaging so that they introduce me in the right way. And then I'm also confirming that they sent the invitation. So the referral is by far the best way, I think, to get an introduction to and then reach out and invite that person to connect. But again, you want to get that introduction and that conversation going. And no one does it very well. Um, A person to look at is Joanne Black. She does a really good job on introducing or inviting people to connect. And then the other thing is being able to engage. So not all of your connections are going to be actively engaging on LinkedIn, but when you do, they're kind of like unicorns. And so anytime a connection of yours engages by sharing their own content or engaging on other people's content, it's a public arena where you can start to have a conversation with them. Like, hey, John Smith, I loved the comment you made on David Newman's post 
about positioning yourself as an influencer? What have you done or have, you know, who else do you recommend? Or, you know, so I can now engage with my prospect who's engaging on your post and ask them a question. And at which point I can very easily say, oh, let's, um, rather than this public conversation, let's make this a private conversation. You know, I'm going to send you an invitation to connect. You know, those are two things that you can do to start that conversation. Of course, if anyone engages on your content, if you're sharing content regularly, which is why it's important to share content regularly, or if they're viewing your profile, if they're congratulating you on, you know, a work anniversary, all of these are triggers that are an invitation for you then to send out an invitation to connect. It's more work and it's way more effective than just blindly sending out invitation after invitation after invitation, right? Yeah. Hey, this interview is a real moneymaker. If you're serious about ramping up your reach and revenue as a speaker, trainer, or expert, book a confidential speaker strategy call with our team. The link is doitmarketing.com slash call. It will be the most valuable 45 minutes you invest in your speaking-driven business. Speaking of value, let's get back to the show. Tell us a little bit, because you mentioned a couple of things that... Um, Putting content out is important, mm-hmm. commenting, engaging on other people's content and your own content. Yeah. We've been hearing this for like ever. <laughs> right. Content is king. Content right. is queen. Content is everything. And of course, every social media book says, just put out incredible content. So in your experience, and when put you're out helpful, your useful client, content. <laughs> yeah. Put out stellar content. Yeah. What the heck does that mean? Like, well, how much? What's outstanding and stellar? Yeah. What's just garbage and shovelware that we should run away from and you yeah. know, take all the crazy advice about, oh, just recycle all of your old articles and put right. them through um, you know, an article recycler. Yeah, and, yeah you know, exactly. Yeah, you know, have it sound yeah. like we're third graders from yeah. Pakistan trying to speak English. Right. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So there's junk, there's okay effort, and then there is the kind of content that you recommend. How would you characterize those three buckets? Yeah, exactly. And we'll throw a few more in there. There's created and curated too, right? So first of all, you know, when we start talking about content with my salespeople, because we're very much focused on B2B sales professionals, but you don't like glaze over. So fortunately, you know, if you're a speaker, an entrepreneur, you probably understand you need content and you're probably at least done a little research and reading on it. But yeah, my sales folks are like, yeah, that's not for me. That's what the marketing team is for. And so, you know, the best content is content you're actually going to put out there. Number one, the second type of content content is content that your buyer or your prospect's going to find useful in whatever part of the buyer's journey they're at. Awareness, consideration, purchase, advocacy. About anger. anger. Anger, anger. Is that one of the <laughs> exactly. phases? That disruption. So I've got seven and don't ask me what they are off the top of my head, but disruption slash anger is actually one of them. I'm pretty uh, good at that one. Yeah, exactly. And so knowing, you know, before you ever create any content at all, it's knowing who your buyer persona is, know who you sell to and what you sell. That's yeah. number one. And, you know, I'm laughing, but oh my gosh, like when you talk to to people about what's their unique selling proposition or who's their buyer persona, and then you say it in their language. So who buys your stuff and what do you sell? A lot of them don't actually know, or there's a huge disconnect between marketing and sales, which is why salespeople go, ah, marketing doesn't work. So first of all, know what you do and who you sell to, and then know where they are in the buyer's journey and know the questions they're asking. And so to actually answer your question, one of the ways that you can create quick and easy, relevant, impactful, quality content is to simply look at the questions that are being asked of you or your company in these different areas of awareness, consideration, purchase, advocacy, and go, okay, what is social selling? That's a good question. Let me answer it. That's going to be my content. You know, how do I use LinkedIn to generate more leads? That's a good question. Let me look at that and generate some content. And then that content can be, the long form blog posts aren't working so well on LinkedIn anymore. So I do what's called a long form update, which is about 1200 characters. I'll do it in notes first so I can add emojis 
relevant emojis, not necessarily poop emojis. But there's a limit to that update. 1,200 length, characters. Right? Yeah, yeah, 1,200 characters. So it's like the world's smallest blog post. I might put a link to a longer post on my website, or I might put a link to a landing page, you know, whatever. But I'll spend that 1,200 characters. I'll identify who I'm speaking to, what the post is about, why they should read it or watch it if I'm doing a native video. A couple bullet points about what might be of interest to them, a call to action and call it good. So that whole thing might take me 10 to 15 minutes and I might do two or three a week. Now, yes, I use everyone's social and, um, you know, like online scheduling tools because I firmly believe you should have some content on there every day. But, you know, honestly, three times a week, 10 to 15 minutes each or less. And those posts usually get, and now mind you, I'm a LinkedIn expert on LinkedIn teaching and training LinkedIn, but those posts tend to get, you know, between three and 5,000 views and upwards of 20 plus comments. So that's pretty decent for like a little bit of time investment. Having said that, I've had- I mean, listen, that's nothing. I get 3,000 views on my stuff. Yeah. Over a four-year period. And over, yeah. over four years. You know, four <laughs> years ago, I think week. I just crossed 3,000 <laughs> views on something. I'm pretty awesome too. <laughs> <laughs> over a week and views are great, but it's about the conversation. So if no one's commenting or sharing your stuff, you yeah. know, yay, it's a good pat on the back, but now what? Let it's- me ask you this, was even while we're on this topic, whether it's a video, whether it's a long form update, what are some mechanisms and some techniques that you have found that engender a lot of response, comments, yeah. and conversation? So first of all, you know, clickbait still works. So I think one of my most commented on posts was content marketing is dead. And so it's 2019 and I used, instead of writing 2019, I used like little emojis to make 2019 stand out. Content marketing is dead. And so, you know, that I was like, no, it's not. Well, of course it's clickbait. Of course it's not dead, but it has changed. And that was kind of the point of that whole little mini post, which then pointed to a longer post we had on our blog post. But as I said before, identify who's going to be interested in reading it because You know, for me, it's sales and marketing. If you're in sales and marketing, especially B2B sales and marketing, you will find some value in my content. If you are a recruiter, you're not going to probably. If you're an internet marketer, probably not. If you sell, you know, $2 products, probably not. So I will identify my reader straight out, either by going, hey, are you a B2B marketer or salesperson? You want to check out this video or you want to check out this post below. So that's identify who should be reading your content. Like I said, some bullet points, because not, especially when I do video, I know everyone says that video is the most consumed social content and maybe it is. I mean, it does seem to be, but I personally don't have time for three or four or five minutes to spend on a video. Like give me a blog post I can scream through and pull out the relevant points. So I want to make sure my non-video watchers, even if it's a native video, will get those three or four relevant points. Emojis, like I said, to make things pop. Feel this yeah. and I know we're getting in the weeds here with the that's technical fine. questions, but that's me. Do you put captions in the video or that's not necessary? I do for that. Well, <laughs> first of all, when I say I understand I create the raw content and we've got a marketing team that makes it pretty, but there are less expensive ways to make things pretty. We use a tool called Subtitle. I don't think it's necessary. However, I think more people you know, when they're sitting in their office and they're not allowed to have the sound on or right. they're on the subway or they're lying next to, you know, their spouse and they're trying not to wake them up at night. Right. Because we're all on LinkedIn instead of spending time with our spouses in the evening in bed. <laughs> so I, I'm some a fan. Some perhaps of, more than others. Some perhaps more than So I'm a fan of the subtitle or closed captioning. Um, platform, also, Vivica, you said the platform is called Zubtitle with a Zub, Z? Z-U-B-T-I-T-L-E. Very cool. Yeah, and um, they do a really good job and I think it's relatively easy to use and we use it on almost all of our video. When I'm timely enough to do the video, send it to my marketing team and know it doesn't need to go out for a day or two. But yeah, being able to use those tools help, but it's not necessary. It's not 100% necessary. And if you have the tool, you might as well use it. Hashtags are a thing again on LinkedIn. So they're not called hashtag communities anymore, but they are. They're like basically hashtag groups similar to Instagram, right? And so when you use a hashtag, your content will get pulled into that hashtag community or that hashtag timeline. And there's a chance if it gets enough engagement or if a LinkedIn editor thinks that it's 
worth it, they might promote it so more people can see it and they'll actually push it out in your notifications. So it's like before when we had articles, LinkedIn would promote your articles to Pulse. Similarly, if you're using a hashtag, they might do that. So our hashtag strategy is one unique hashtag that you can always find things under. So Van Gressovids is one that we use. So we can always, everyone on our team can also always find articles that we post with that hashtag in it. Nice. And then two popular ones with you know, the hopes that they'll get promoted, social selling, selling with LinkedIn, LinkedIn, LinkedIn tips, LinkedIn expert, whatever, you know. So basically choose one unique and two that you want to get promoted under. Are there ways to figure out which hashtags are more popular where you want to be in those channels? Yeah. So if you go into your, uh, there's a couple different places. If you go to your mobile, it's kind of hard to find, but if you go to your mobile phone and jump into your profile, because that makes total sense. On the left-hand side, there's like a little hamburger And so you'll actually be able to see recent hashtags. And from there, you can go to discover more and it will show you hashtags that people are following that LinkedIn thinks you might be interested in. You know, so I have finances for 4,727,000. So it tells you the number right there. It tells you the number right there of followers. And then you can also, if you go into your settings, you can also check out the discover more tab and find some hashtags there as well. So I Either way, basically get into it the same way from your desktop or your mobile. But yes, that will show you. Another, here's a ninja trick. So company pages and not all company page community managers know this yet. So it's not fail safe. But if you go into companies, either that are good prospects of yours or are like yours or would be or already clients of yours, anyway, good companies on LinkedIn that make sense for you, they will have up to three hashtags listed. And so a lot of times, you know, you could kind of make a list and you don't have to use the same three every time, by the way. Um, use one that's unique, but the other two you can switch out all the time. So I had to actually make a list of those hashtags in an Excel sheet or something. And then that way I would pull in those hashtags. The first three are the important ones that LinkedIn is going to look at and potentially elevate. But the other ones you could still pop in there and you'll still get moved into the timeline. It's just you know, not likely that you'll get elevated for hashtag number 15. Also, don't do 15 hashtags, five tops, I would right. say. But yeah, hashtags are a thing. You look needy and desperate. You do. You do kind of look needy and desperate with all the hashtags. And same thing with at mention. So you can at mention people who are relevant to the post, but I wouldn't start like tagging anyone who should be reading it. I would, you know, if I interviewed (laughs) somebody, I would use them. If somebody asked me a question, I would tag them. If it was a company or a leader at a company that we were mentioning, I would tag them. You can tag people. Not everyone has it myself included, but some people on your mobile device, when you upload a photo or video, you can actually tag them and then it's hidden. So they get notified, but you don't look desperate, but definitely tag anyone who's relevant to that actual post. And then if there is someone who should see that post, you can always click the three dots on the top right-hand side, like you would with any social, grab the link, and you can then send that as a private message, right. in an email, you know, as a message on Facebook, for heaven's sake. So right. you can find a way to share that content with them privately, yeah. which, you know, more likely they'll click through and read it if you do that. Now, you and I were talking before we got the microphones rolling. Yes, indeed. Do microphones roll? This one does. Yeah, saying. yeah, that one will roll. <laughs> but I'm not Blue using that one. Roll. <laughs> this one was not going to roll so far. No, no, this the one headset's just... not rolling. Okay. Headset's not rolling. Well, before we got the microphones rolling, whether they actually roll or not, we were talking about a multi-touch strategy where it's yeah. not just about what you do on LinkedIn, right. but how you're using email marketing and how that connects to your LinkedIn strategy, how you're using video or YouTube or live streaming and how that connects with your LinkedIn strategy. So what are some integration points? What are some kind of do's and don'ts? And I know this goes back to, you know, probably five, six, seven years ago where it's like, I know we'll use these social media aggregators and we'll just post once and it'll appear everywhere. Everywhere. And the Twitter will be the same as the LinkedIn, same as the Facebook, same as everything. And I can go back to my day. 
So exactly. That's, obviously, that's cloning. That's monkey nonsense. That's monkey yeah. spam, we call it. What yeah. are some smart integration strategies when we're looking at our overall kind of marketplace presence, LinkedIn yeah. plus email, LinkedIn plus video, LinkedIn plus other social platforms? So, you know, and it's funny, we do use everyone's social. I try to at least you know, like change up the posts that go out, but I, I do schedule because convenience. There are some things that I just know will not get out there if I don't schedule them ahead of time. That being said, all of the socials do better if it's native, if you upload the link natively. And I don't know about the other socials, but LinkedIn definitely does better if you spend a little time with that description section, which we talked about, the 1200 characters, who is this for, blah, 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 blah. Now, having said that, you know, what is cool, so one of the things we talk about at Vangresso a lot is content for sales enablement. And so there are some things that definitely fall into the content marketing arena. Anything to build awareness, you know, those really nicely produced videos, eBooks that you download from the website, the blog, those are all like one-to-many type media and that's content marketing. Content for sales enablement is when you take that content and as I mentioned earlier, serve it to the buyer at the right time in the right place. And so what's cool is on all the socials, you could grab a link to whatever that update is. So you can take something that's content marketing. You can take something that your marketing team developed, you know, if you're in a big corporation and I can then take that content and I can private message you know, the link to that content and tell the person, maybe it's a small group of people because in both LinkedIn and Facebook, I'm not sure about Instagram, I'm sure Instagram too. You could create little groupings of people, like private message, little groupings of people. So maybe you do that, but I can send them and say, hey, I know that you have this issue. You know, we were talking about it last week that you were frustrated with this thing and we wrote this article or I found this article. It could be somebody else's article as long as it's not a competitor. And I thought you might be interested at copy paste. So you can always share those links when it comes to having a, uh, you know, either your head of the marketing team or your head of the sales team, you can always take those links and say, Hey, sales guys and gals, you know, if you've got prospects in the consideration phase who are asking about this, click on share this link. If they're asking about this, click and share this link. If they're asking about this, click and share that link. And then we use a tool called Everyone's Social, which allows us to do a quick video. And then we can plug the links into almost like a landing page. And so we send them privately, either through an email or through private messaging on LinkedIn. The client sees me, Kurt, Mario, Bernie speaking to... These work really well for out of office messages, by the way. They see us speaking to them and it'll either be, hey, thanks for inviting me to connect or it'll be, hey, John, thanks for sending that message. And then, you know, uh, totally get where you're coming from. I know you're not ready to buy yet. No worries. Um, We've got a free ebook that will help you get your branding set up. We've got this great book on our PVC method, which will help you create personalized value added CTA type messaging. And by the way, I know that, you know, $50,000 was way too much of an investment, but you know, we also have the course online for $500 and here's our special promo code, but it's 90% of the time with permission, right? They've already connected with me. They've reached out to me, but it allows me to follow up with them with the video, which gives them a good sense of who I am. And I'm curating our company's content. I'm not, I haven't, I created one of those pieces of content. I didn't create them all. And you don't have to create any of them. You just have to be the one who curates them. So whether you're using a tool like OneMob or you're just sending an email that does that very same thing, that's how you can grab that content, marketing content, and turn it into content for sales enablement content. Super quick commercial break. Isn't this interview amazing? If you'd like to get more ideas on how to start or grow your speaking business fast, pop over to our free training at doitmarketing.com slash webinar. Now, you mentioned one mob, and I see, Vivica, on your LinkedIn profile that you are on their board yes. of advisors. Yes, yes. And so in case um, people don't know, one mob is a Vimeo. cool sort of little video yeah. application. Tell us about yeah, it and tell yeah. us how you got this advisory position. Yeah. So, and yes, I'm on the board of advisory. I also think it's the best tool. And having said that, Videolicious is another good tool. Um, there's a bunch of good video email tools out there. We got on the board position because 
they were a client of ours and we were using them and they liked the way we used it. And they said, Hey, you guys use us in a really good way. Do you want to sit on our board? So we do. So I don't know that I've ever been called into a board meeting, but nonetheless, I'm on their board. And so I don't get any monetary value, just I'm not an affiliate or anything like that, but I do sit on their board. For me, it's really, it's two scenarios. It's the landing page. And I think some of the other ones have the landing page now too. They didn't when Mob started, but I think other video tools have the landing page now, which is good. For me, it's the tracking. We literally, I love this, Kurt sent a one mob video to a point of contact at a company that he was prospecting. And he watched as that video got passed from, you know, purchasing committee to member to purchasing committee member to purchasing committee. So his video got passed along to seven or eight people and we saw them open it. We saw how long they stayed on it and we were able to trace that. So we knew we had a pretty good possibility of landing that client. So stuff like that, I think is really important, which is why it's so important to take the conversation as soon as you can actually off LinkedIn, whether you take it to email to a tool like that, because LinkedIn doesn't have that kind of tracking ability. Some email does, especially if you use something like HubSpot tracking and there's other great tracking tools out there. Um, But it's important, I think, once you get into the sales conversation mode to be able to track who's actually opening your stuff and who isn't. So I think you said something very important that you and I and maybe some professional salespeople would take for granted, but it may be news to some of our listeners that this whole concept of social selling and sales enablement, taking someone from one phase of the process to the next phase, right? We're taking them one step closer to a check. This happens individually. This is not about, hey, do I batch and blast my network on LinkedIn? Do I send the same message to 50 different people? No, you don't send the same message to 50 different people. So it's selling... It's the old school one-on-one relationship-based value-centric selling, but it happens online. And as you say, LinkedIn can be the starting place, but then you take it to a phone call or a Zoom call or an email and you treat them like human beings. And like with the custom video being a great example, the reason it got passed along is because it was directly relevant to them. Exactly. And it said, hey, Barbara, it was so great having the meeting last week with the team. We can't wait to get started. Here's three quick questions for you to, you know, even before we decide to sign anything, three quick questions for you and the team. Add value, right? Hello, add value. Exactly. Anytime someone says, well, should I just blast this out on platform X? And they usually say, should I blast this out on LinkedIn? My stock answer is no, you shouldn't be blasting anything out. That's not sales, that's noise. That's right. And with everything getting noisier and noisier and noisier, it becomes less and less and less effective. So you need to do something to stand out. And that's where all that was old is new again. I mean, again, at this conference that we were just at, and this we could go off another down another rabbit hole, a lot of Gen Z and even some millennial sellers, I mean, I'll just go ahead and throw business people in as well and small business owners are afraid of the phone. Like, They really don't know how to have a sales conversation because everything they do is email and texting or blasting, blasting. And so what can make an enormous difference in your success, if you're selling something or if you're trying to land more speaking gigs or whatever, is actually picking up the phone. What a concept. This also works as a phone besides just like a Facebook browsing device. I've heard that these devices also have some telephoning Or selfie. Yes. Phoning and selfieing. <laughs> you should call it the I selfie. Then you'd get the exactly. pronoun in there twice. With a yeah. phone app included. <laughs> See that little picture of that thing that kind of looks like a seashell? That's what telephones used That's to look exactly. like, kids. Like, you know, this is the same thing. Now we're getting off on a total tangent. <laughs> You're in Microsoft Office. People go, what's that little box? It looks like there's a little box that's the save button. What are those things? Those are three and a half inch diskettes. Exactly. That's what those are. Even though we're saving Amazing. things to the cloud, the icon is still the little three and a half inch diskette. But that's okay. Well, this would be the reason I no longer do this, you know, LinkedIn, your Rolodex on steroids, because they're like, what's the Rolodex? That's right. That's right. So that's gone by the wayside. So let's <laughs> zoom out as we start to wrap up here. I want to do a big picture survey of thought leadership. Thought leadership and... Uh, 
positioning yourself as a thought leader, as a trusted advisor, not as yep. a salesperson, God forbid, right. not as a vendor. I hate that word. Oh, vendor. yes. It's like, oh, you're a vendor. Well, you'll have to talk to our purchasing department because you're a vendor. I think there's nothing more insulting to a professional salesperson than to be called a yeah. vendor. Exactly. And hopefully they've worked so hard. Unless you're signing that. the vendor agreement with Microsoft and then you could call yes. me a vendor I'm all okay day I'm okay signing long. the vendor agreement. I just don't want you to consider me a vendor. So <laughs> exactly. how do we escape vendor status and really start to earn this title and positioning of thought leading professional? Well, you know, vendors sell products or services. So the second we start to position ourselves away from selling a product or a service and just consistently putting yourself out there as a person who shares helpful, useful content, which we've now told you how to do that relatively easily, that will begin the mindset shift from people who are considering you to be sellers. Of course, the other thing is stop being a seller. You know, stop with the bad practices especially when you productize or commoditize, you know, then it only becomes a numbers game and you're never going to win that way. Well, maybe yeah. you will, but like who wants to win that way? There's you know, only one Walmart. You 99% can't Walmart, Walmart. off. Like that drives me nuts. You know, yeah. our program at the most, you might get 20% off. We are not going to take our $700 program and sell it to you for $49. It's not valuable if we can do that. It truly isn't. We can't do that. Anyway, now that's another soapbox of mine. But um, so move away from the commoditization, move away from the hard pitch selling, move into having conversations, positioning yourself as someone helpful and useful. That means it might take more time to listen. (laughs) Ooh, there's a concept listening. I'm not very good at that. But you know, it might take more time to listen in on your network. And it might take a little bit more time to be thoughtful in the creation or the curation of content that you serve your network. And you might have to have more one-on-one interactions. But in the end, you know, when your numbers start to go up, you're like, oh, this works okay, I'll do it. It's actually simpler. It's not easier because it's easy to push a button and automatically go bleh but it might be simpler and it might be more effective in landing your ideal client. And so, yeah, that (laughs) don't be a dick, I think is. (laughs) Well, what I was going to say is sometimes the shortcut can be the long way around, right? There is no shortcut. You got to put in the work. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And I mean, it just drives me nuts. It's kind of that like, oh, give a webinar and make a million dollars mentality. It's the magical thinking. And, you know, the magical thinking is as alive and well in sales and marketing as it is in metaphysical woo-woo. I mean, you have to have the right mindset. You have to know what to do and you have to take action. Right. There's no push button. There's no push button, easy button. It sounds like if we're willing to do the work. And like you said, everything yeah. old is new again. Yeah. Relationship selling, value selling, actually building value, not just talking yeah. price or features, right? But talking about outcomes and results. Right. And then sticking with the process because yeah. buyers yeah. buy for their own reasons on their own timeline. They don't buy That's for your it. reasons and they don't buy yeah. on your timeline. <laughs> Don't we wish they did? And that's it. And that's why the content is so important because I might not need this makeup brush today. I do actually. But you know, I might really need it Friday at two o'clock. And if that makeup brush happens to come across my timeline at Friday at two o'clock, I might just talk to the person who can sell it to me. Yeah. Makeup brush is a wrong example. It just happened to be what was in front of me. (laughs) I'm I'm curious who your other podcast is with at Friday at two o'clock, if it's not worth it for this one. (laughs) All right. Well, I'm going to ask you two questions as we wrap up here, Vivica. Question number two is going to be, how do people get in touch and stay in touch with more of your genius? The question before that, if people were to take one central idea from our conversation today, about the entire world of social selling. What would you hope that key concept would be? Just flip engagement and connection. Engage before you invite people to connect. Earn the right. Earn the right, exactly. Exactly. Now, how do people get connected and stay connected to more Vivica Von Rosen genius? Yeah, so I paid off Google. And if you Google LinkedIn expert, my LinkedIn profile is probably the second or the third non-paid ad. I didn't actually pay them up. Every time I say that, I'm like, oh, please let it still be true. But yeah, so if you Google LinkedIn expert, my LinkedIn profile is probably the second or third profile that'll pop up. Well, probably the first LinkedIn profile and 
maybe the second or third link. So click through to that. Please feel free to invite me to connect. Just customize the invitation and let me know that you heard me on, you know, David's podcast. You can find us on Vengresso 1S, not like the soup. V-E-N-G-R-E-S-O. You can email me. I'm very old school. So if you email me, Vivica at Vengresso.com, I will respond. But again, if you go to LinkedIn, all of my contact information is on LinkedIn. If you want to book an appointment with me, you could do that on LinkedIn. All of our, you know, our 1-800 number and my cell phone number is on LinkedIn. So, you know, feel free to reach out. There's no way you can't not get in in touch with me. I like it. (laughs) I'll double negatives. Just in case people have any kind of memory disability, you know, you remember back when President Trump called Tim Cook, Tim Apple, that's like calling Vivica, Vivica Vengresso. Exactly. Which will also get me found on LinkedIn. Exactly. But so it's not Tim Apple and it's also not Vivica Vengresso. It's Vengresso. Rosen. And thank you, my friend. This was completely awesome. I appreciate you. My pleasure. Thank you so much, David. Well, that wraps up another episode of The Speaking Show. Hey, tell you what, if you like us, rate us and review us on iTunes. Subscribe, tell a friend. Go grab the notes and downloads and extras at thespeakingshow.com. See you next time.